So if you would, please bow your heads, and we're going to start with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, how precious is life. And it's even more precious when we know you, Lord. Because we know that no matter what happens in this world, Lord, you, you have promises that you gave us. And we know those promises are in your word. And we know that you will come again one day and the dead in Christ will rise, Lord. And we have faith. We believe that, Jesus, that Lily believed in you. And we believe that one day we will see her again when we all rise and go to heaven, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you'll be with each one of us. Touch our heart. Each person that has to speak, Lord, I know it's emotional, but I just pray that you'll be with each one and let them bring out the words with joy, with peace, thanking upon how much joy Lily brought into our life. So I thank you, Lord, for the time that we had. And when, as we celebrate here, I pray that your presence will be with the hearts of each person here. We thank you so much, Lord, and we love you. And we pray this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. For a scripture this morning... If you have access to a Bible, please go ahead and turn to Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. There may be some Bibles in the pews in front of you, or you have your cell phones. I'll give you a moment to get to there. I'm reading from the King James Version. Ezekiel chapter 3, starting with verse 1. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. Yeah. I say Ezekiel? I am so sorry. I <laughs> Ecclesiastes... I don't know why I would be going to Ezekiel. Please forgive me. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. <laughs> yes, I, I, I purposely did that because I know how much Lily loves comedy. <laughs> so Ezekiel chapter 3, let's try this again. Thank you. I, I'm just testing y'all to see if y'all are awake this morning. See... I want to bring laughter, and some, for some reason, the human nature thinks that there's something funny about people making mistakes. So the more mistakes that y'all come up here and make, the better time we're going to have today. Amen? Amen. Ezek Ecclesiastes chapter 3. <laughs> Amen. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 3. <laughs> to everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. Today, we're here to celebrate the life of Vivian Lee Matlock, also known as Lily. And we want to present to you the stages of her life. For each season of life, we're going to have four stages of her life. And the first stage this morning, her husband, Wayne Matlock, will present this to us. been asked to do some difficult things sometimes, and believe it or not, I did accomplish some of them, but today I've been asked to tell you a 66-year-long story in five minutes, so let's see what I can do with it. First of all, I'll just cut off most of it. Um, we'll start back in the early 1950s when I made my first trip to Gentry, Arkansas to go to school. And this is uh, one uh, Sabbath. Church has just let out, and a friend of mine, a tall fellow, uh, four or five inches taller than me, 
were standing outside the church watching people leave, and uh, he nudged me and pointed as two girls walking up a hill headed for the girls' dorm. One of them was a tall girl, and he wanted me to see how attractive she was. I spotted her, and uh, later on, after I got to know who she was, I remembered that, but I immediately focused on the short girl beside her. I didn't know who she was, but she caught my attention. And fast forward now until about two months before school was out, uh, I'm working in a broom shop, and once a year, about two months before school is out, my boss and his wife, who was the supervisor of the kitchen crew, held what they call the annual uh, broom shop kitchen picnic, where they'd take their kids that work for them out in the country somewhere, and uh, we had to have a picnic lunch and, and then play games of some kind for entertainment for a while and go back. Uh, in order to get out there, uh, the broom shop had a middle-sized truck, a flatbed, and they had built some sides on it uh, and then put some uh, steel bars and shaped them uh, as a top over and threw a tarp over it so he could haul the uh, brooms to market while it, even if it was raining. Well, they threw us all in the back of that truck and uh, we all had to stand up. We'd hang on to that steel bar to, uh, you know, keep from falling. And with the tarp down, uh, if you've ever been in a room in a building that didn't have any windows with the lights out and shut the door, that's what it was like in the back of that truck. You couldn't see anybody. Well, there's a lot of chattering going on, and I'm standing there by myself riding in the waiting and all of a sudden I feel somebody's arm brush against mine and uh, hey that had electricity in it and that, that wasn't a guy that was some girl's arm I had no idea who it was uh, but all of a sudden that uh, arm had a voice and began to talk to me and I don't remember a single word it was said but I remember how captivating that voice was and those of you who know Vivian know that she had a gentleness in her speech and a certain uh, manner in her voice. It was just, uh, it just captivates you. Well, I listened to her talk and probably said a few words back myself, uh, mostly grunting in response to what she would say. Uh, and we got there, and when we, when we got out, I thought, well, that's that girl I was watching walk up the hill. And, of course, I still didn't know who she was, uh, but it turned out to be Vivian, as you guessed by now. And that, nothing else happened then except I remembered it on Saturday nights, the school would have uh, socials for the kids, so that uh, you have a little entertainment along with all the work and studies we did. And uh, I got to noticing which group she would get with, and find myself going to that group so I could be with her and close to her and it wasn't long until she noticed that and uh, within no, no, just a few weeks uh, whichever one of us got there first we'd go to the other one and uh, very quickly we became recognized as a couple by the student body and then when school was out uh, which wasn't too long that little bit of courtship didn't last very long but we got a little uh, bonus out of it. She didn't come home immediately. She stayed for camp meeting, and her folks picked her up afterwards. So we got to spend a little more time together during that time, and um, bonding uh, kind of got a little stronger. And we decided we'd write to each other when the school was out. So we did, and after a few letters, we wrote a lot, uh, about three times a week. and. Uh, after a, a few letters passed, I asked her to check with the parents, see if they'd mind if I'd come down and visit her. And she wrote back and said yes. So uh, we set a date when I would show up. I was going to show up on a Thursday night. But uh, when I got up uh, Wednesday morning, somebody told me she was through there the night before. 
I thought, what? And she didn't make contact with me. I thought, well, maybe she don't feel about me like I do about her. <laughs> so I didn't know whether to come on down here or not. And uh, so that night, I talked to God about it and told him how I felt about her, and, but I didn't know after that. And maybe, maybe I um, ought to think twice about going. And I thought, okay, I'll leave with you. You tell me what to do. And, and I'll get up in the morning and I'll know whether to go down there or go home. And the idea hit me. I'll let God make the decision by who picks me up. And uh, when I get to the end of where 71, coming from uh, Fayetteville to uh, Highway 64, the highway that was connecting Fort Smith and Little Rock, if my ride's going toward Little Rock, I'll just go on home and forget about her. If it's going the other way, uh, I'm going to go on to Malvern. Folks, they picked me up in Fedville and they put me out on Malvern Avenue in Hot Springs. Ah, now you're talking. <laughs> so I caught a ride on over, I got off at Magnet Cove, and then I got a ride, a bus stopped and picked me up there and brought me on into town. And when I got to her house, her dad answered the door, and uh, I walked in the door, and he had me, invited me in, and I walked in, and he called to Vivian. And I'm telling you, when she walked in there and saw it was me, the look on her face told me everything I wanted to know. Said, Boy, yeah, I made the right decision, you know, <laughs> and I know it showed on me, too. And we talked a few minutes, and then she left her dad to entertain me while she disappeared in the back. She come back holding up the car key, said, let's go get some ice cream. So we went over to uh, uh, King Cone. Some of you uh, see faces that will remember that, an ice cream place that uh, doesn't exist anymore. But we went over and got some ice cream. And that's the first time in our time together that we had privacy for what followed that. And on the way back home, I kissed her for the first time. And as soon as I got a taste of that sugar bowl, I was hooked for life. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for blessing me with the honor of being the husband of one of the most loving and lovable people you ever put on this planet. And thank you folks for listening to me.
There we go. Hello, everyone. My helper. Um, I'm Summer. Next step, kids. Uh, I was going to tell you about what a passionate person my mom was, but you all knew her. I don't need to tell you that. But I would like to share a story with you that, it, that uh, to me, it's hilarious. But, but uh, it shows what a compassionate person she was. I was about maybe a little bit older than Madeline, not much. And we went to Safeways in Cleburne, Texas, buy groceries. That's back when you could buy two full buggies for less than 50 bucks. <laughs> and uh, they had watermelons on sale for a dollar a piece. These great big old black diamond watermelons. And my, my dad loved watermelons, so she thought, well, I'll get one for Wayne. So she goes over there and starts looking for one. And there's this one sitting off by itself over there. And it had a hole in it about the size I could poke my finger down inside of it. So... That's the one she wanted because nobody else would buy it. She was so passionate about that watermelon. So we, we put it in the buggy and went on home. That even Dad got home and he saw that watermelon. Oh, boy, watermelon. He got the knife out and he went over there and cut it. And it was rotten through and through. <laughs> and he asked, what would you buy this for? Well, I felt sorry for it. Nobody else would buy it. <laughs> That's my mama. <laughs> uh, but... That's all through my life as I, I grew up, I watched her grow too. And, and uh, you know, she was only what, 19, maybe 20 when I was born. So I got to watch her grow up too, really. And uh, she was my role model, basically. And at first, she stayed at home and took care of us. And later on, she went to work when we got old enough to go to school. And, uh, all through my life, everything she did was uh, to uh, take care of us and, and uh, provide for us and do the things that uh, a loving parent would do for us. So, as time went on, mom and dad came back to church and started going to church again. And, and since mom could play the piano, well, that was her role. And she said, right over here at that, at that piano for, what, 40 years? A long time, anyway. And uh, she had a lot of favorite songs, but there's one song that uh, her and my Aunt Leor, they, they first time they heard me sing it, both of them said, when I pass away, I want you to sing that song at my funeral. Well, I did it for Aunt Leor, so now I'm doing it for my mama. So the song I want to sing is called Through It All. Mm -hmm. i 
Let me tell you about the fall of Lily's life. And you may be wondering why I keep calling Vivian Matlock Lily. I believe that this name was adapted sometime around the fall of her life when she started getting grandkids. If you've ever seen a two or a three year old try to say the name Vivian, it may not come out too well sometimes. And Lily was this always the cool person. She always wanted to be cool and she didn't think that being a grandma, no offense to any grandmas, but she wanted to be, she wanted to stay young so she didn't like us to call her grandma. So we came up with the word Lily because her middle name is Lee and somehow kids always like to repeat themselves when they say something so we always called her Lily. And I think of a time probably about, I was about six, seven, eight years old in this period and I remember a good time with my sisters and I always thought the excitement of the week was anticipating the weekend with Lily. and you see I always got excited for church maybe for the wrong reasons but it was not necessarily the wrong reason but for one of the biggest reasons because I got to sit by my Lily during church and I remember sitting right there in this front pew here by the piano every Sabbath and I remember Lily telling me she always had something for me every week. I don't know what it was. Sometimes it was an ink pen. Sometimes it was a, a, a pretty coin or something. Um, something neat, a little gadget. She would always go to the Christian bookstore and buy something. She would always hand it to me. So I was always excited for what kind of surprise I was going to have this Sabbath. But I really just enjoyed sitting beside her. I wasn't much interested in the sermon as a little kid. But she always made me stay reverent in church. She always gave me a piece of paper. And she said, I want you to draw. <laughs> I was never gifted as a drawer like my sister. But I always enjoyed drawing. And I can't tell you how many times I draw the stained glass window you can't see anymore. I can't tell you how many times I draw somebody standing behind this pulpit. And I even drew her playing that piano. And I just have good memories of sitting there drawing. <laughs> but the highlight of the Sabbath was getting to go home and spend Saturday night with Lily. And I remember there was like a ritual. When we left here, the, we would head down Military Road, Old Military Road, and we would come into Butterfield, and everybody knows the big hill there. That was called Wee Wee Hill. We would go really fast. I don't mean to get Papa in trouble for speeding, but he was speeding on the Sabbath over the hill. <laughs> And we would all go, wee! So it became the Wee Wee Hill. And not too far down, I believe it's Rayburn Creek. Um, it was a dirt road then. And this was before the mine started filling in the creek. So it was actually a pretty good creek there. That, maybe that was Nine Mile Creek. Which one did we play in? Wee Creek. It, we eventually called it Wee Creek. I'm trying to think of the official name for it. But we called it Wee Creek. We had Wee Wee Hill and then we had Wee Creek. And we would always stop there and we would take our shoes off and we would go wade in the water. And this, this water was very clear then. And we just had a good time. I remember Lily sometimes, I don't know if she ever got in the water with us, but she would come down there and she just enjoyed watching us have fun in the water. So the trip would uh, travel, we would continue to travel. This time she lived in Little Rock and we would head towards Little Rock and then there was a certain soccer field right before you got to the Geyer Springs exit. Every time we got to this soccer field there was a song that every grandchild in the car knew and it goes something like we're almost a Lily's house, we're almost a Lily's house and we would sing, con sing, continue to sing this song over and over and over. I can think as an adult that would probably start to get irritating with me <laughs> But I praise God, my grandparents, they never bothered them. They loved for us to, to, sing the happy, to see the happiness that we had coming to their house. So for about five minutes, we would chant, we're almost to Lily's house. And then we would get to there, and we would enjoy a nice, peaceful, quiet Saturday afternoon. And then we would prepare for dinner, and we would go to El Chico's restaurant. And we always loved going to El Chico's. And I think the fan favorite was bean and cheese nachos and Hawaiian fruit punch and we would love that we would love going there every Sabbath and on special occasions she may do something special for us and take us to Chuck E. Cheese but we always had fun with Lily and then the next day she would always take us to the mall she loved to shop anybody that knows Lily knows she loved to shop I think the home shopping channel was created for her benefit 
But the reason she loved to shop was not for herself. She loved to shop for others. I remember summertime, she's watching Shopping Channel, and she's already thinking about Christmas. And I remember when Christmas would get here as kids, can you imagine five-year-olds getting tired to open Christmas presents because there was so many of them? Lily was always a giver, and she just gave her heart to us, and she was just a role model for each one of us, and we love her for that. And I have so many other good memories we just don't have time for. And that's the season of the fall. And I just want to throw this in here. This is leading up to the song service. Lily was wanting me to sing special music. And I told her, that's not my talent. I can preach, praise God. I can teach. I can do a lot of stuff. But singing was never my talent. But she kept on me. She wanted me to do that. And she also wanted me to preach a specific ser sermon. She wanted me to preach about heaven. And you know, I started writing a sermon for heaven about three, three years ago. And I never got around to doing it for her. But I got to write a melody that I was going to sing. It was just a bunch of my favorite hymns about heaven. And I'd like to sing that with y'all's help this morning. God didn't gift me with a singing voice, but I hope that y'all will help me out a little bit. And before we start singing, I just want to ask you a question. Are you burdened by the darkness of this lonely world? Are you tired of the trials that seem so hard? Jesus, he understands, and there's healing in his hands, and he wants you to know that there's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. Meet me in heaven, we'll join hands together. Meet me by the Savior's side. I'll meet you in heaven. We'll sing songs together. Brothers and sisters, I'll be there. Shall we gather at the river? Where bright angels' feet have trod With its crystal tides forever Flowing by the throne of God Yes, we will gather at the river The beautiful, the beautiful river Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Kristen. Um, I guess I'm representing Winter, the great-grandkids. Um, my older sister, Emily, was asked to talk because, you know, she had the longest time with Lily. She's got the most and the best memories with her. But I volunteered to do it because I figured, you know, I would be the most emotionally stable to do it. But after all this, I don't think I am. <laughs> but um, she wrote it out, so it's a little easier. I'm just going to read what she wrote, so just bear with me here. <laughs> Talking about Lily was always such an easy topic. Seemed like I could brag about her, how amazing she was for hours and hours. These last few months, however, that has been a topic that I avoid. 
I want to tell the whole world all about her, but the pain in my heart has yet to heal. Lily meant the world to me. Her death has been the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with. I didn't just lose a grandma, I lost my best friend. Lily was the one person that was always there for me. The life lessons that she passed on have helped me become the person I am and will continue to guide me through the rest of my life. Pretty is as pretty does. To most, that sounds like a silly saying, but anyone who knows Lily knows that this was the motto she taught us to live by. But not only did she teach us this motto, she also lived, by, lived it herself. She was beautiful and wise, a woman of extreme strength, courage, and love. Her unconditional love and contagious laughter were her best qualities. It didn't matter what you had done, her love wouldn't change at all. You could go to her with literally any problem and she would always have the best advice. She was the foundation of our family, the heartbeat, the center. You'll never find an, another person like Lily. I can only hope to be half as wonderful as she was. I was told that I had five to ten minutes to tell about growing up with Lily, but all the one, with all the wonderful memories she gave me, it couldn't possibly even scratch the, service, scratch the surface. Instead, I want to tell you all of my favorite memory of her. One Sabbath afternoon, after all the adults left, it was just Lily, Papa, and us kids. We were starting to get bored, so Lily came up with a game for us to play. She had us find muffin pans for each of us and a rubber bouncy ball. We had no idea what she's going on, what she was going, where she was going with this, and it was a strange combination, but we should have known better to doubt Lily. She had one of us throw the ball to her and she hit it with a pan just like playing baseball. Oh, I lost my place. <laughs> If you've ever played with one of those little rubber balls, you know they bounce all over the place with no clear path. It seemed strange at first playing with buff and pans, but this simple game became one of the highlights of our childhood. We all laughed harder than any of us had before. Thinking back on it, we can still see Lily laughing. She was laughing so hard that she had a hard time catching her breath, and Papa had to bring her her oxygen mask. Lily was always a happy person, but we never had seen her as happy as she was in that moment. That smile, that contagious laugh, that is what I remember first when I thought of Lily. Until Madeline came along. Madeline was her great-great-granddaughter. Not many people can say they have memories of their great-great-grandparents, but Madeline has a bunch. She didn't get a whole lot of time with Lily, but the few short years that she got to spend with her were full of wonderful memories. Lily loved Madeline so much that she became all Lily could talk about. She always wanted to know where Madeline was and what she was doing. They played games and had tea parties every time that we visited and just asked Madeline about Lily's stories. <laughs> Who's got my big toe? <laughs> she loved to see Madeline. She loved to tell Madeline that story. I look back and I can still see Madeline racing Lily down the hall with the wheelchair and looking at all of the cute things in the hutch that generations before her were not allowed anywhere near. Madeline and Lily shared a special friendship. They both looked forward to their visits, just the same as we all look forward to seeing our next visit with, Le with Lily. Soon and very soon, we will all be together again. surrounding me let it break at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus breathe call these bones to live call these 
on sin once again I will praise Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus You silence fear Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus That the shadows can deny Your name cannot be overcome Your name is alive Forever lifted high Your name cannot be overcome Jesus, Jesus Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay. It's good to uh, be home to see everybody. I just wish we were here for a different reason. But um, it's hard losing two grandmas in the first three months of this year. But as I, as I think back growing up with Lily, I, I remember, um, I know some of y'all will not believe this, but I, I was actually the family brat. Um, I remember when um, I was going to school in, in Little Rock, a lot of times Lily would pick me up. She would drop me off at school in the morning and pick me up in the evening. And there was one day, I think I was in the eighth grade, and at the school they would, um, the ninth and the tenth graders took biology class, and it was offered every other year, so that way the ninth and tenth graders took it together. Well, this particular year they had an odd number of students in the biology class, and so when it came time to dissect frogs, they needed one extra person to help. And I got to be that person. And uh, I thought it was so cool, thank you, that I wrapped up about half the spare parts in a paper towel and stuck them in my locker. Then when Lily picked me up, while we were driving home, I pulled it out and started showing them to her. <laughs> she didn't like that so much. <laughs> One of my uh, favorite stories about Lily, Lily was on the uh, church social committee here for ever. And uh, one year, as part of the social committee, she was supposed to plan a church social, and so she, she wanted to come up with some new ideas. Because, you know, it's boring when, when every church social, you do the same games and the same activities. You get tired of it, so you want to find something new, right? So she thought she would find something new to do, so she got out, or she went to her computer, 
went to Google and did a search for the phrase adult games. I never heard what she found. <laughs> I don't want to know what she found. <laughs> but um, another one of my favorite memories, when I first started pastoring, I pastored in a town, oddly enough, Vivian, Louisiana. I always thought that was cool. And one day I was visiting uh, a lady who had, uh, she was an Adventist but was not a member of my church, but she had come to some of my evangelistic meetings. And so I was visiting her at her house one, one afternoon. And she had something that she says, I'm, I'm going to throw this away. And I thought, well, you know, what it was, it was, it was you remember, um, I don't know if they still do this or not, but it used to be that... Um, when people uh, were on food stamps, they also had various uh, items of government food that they would give you, like government cheese and uh, government peanut butter, uh, stuff like that. Well, she had, uh, amongst her things, she had a can about this size of pork. That's all it said on the label of the can was pork. And being a good Seventh-day Adventist, she had no use for that, and so she was going to throw it away. And, and I said, well, don't throw that away. I've got cats that will eat that. So she gives it to me. But I go home and I start thinking, you know, I wouldn't eat that stuff. I don't want to give it to my cats either. I don't want my cats to get sick from this. So I'll, I'll just, I'll throw it away. But I forgot to throw it away. So sometime later, I'm up here in Malvern visiting Lily and Papa. And I see that can in my car. And so I pick it up, nobody else was around, I think she was at work and you were probably at work too. So I just went in and opened up the cupboard and kind of moved some cans around and stuck it back there and kind of turned it around so she could, no one could actually see what the label said and, and put other cans in front of it and, and then I left. And I guess a couple of weeks later she was going to cook something and so she reaches in and takes out this can and she's just about to open it when she saw the label and she's like, what in the world? How did this? Oh, Ethan was here. <laughs> but my favorite is probably what was the longest. This actually started with my mom when I was a kid. Lily was the church treasurer here and I don't remember when my mom started this, but one Sabbath when, when she was filling out her tithe envelope and my mom was putting her tithe and offerings in the tithe envelope, she thought she would do, pull a little joke on Lily. So, you know, on the tithe envelope they have this little blank where you can write in something that you want to give to if it's not already on the envelope. So she put on there, treasurer, two cents. Give the treasurer a tip. Give Lily two cents. And we thought that was funny, so she did it the next week and the next week. And I don't know how long she did it, but when she quit doing it, I kept doing it. And then in March, when I got the call, that I had to go to the hospital because I wasn't going to see her again. I was standing there talking to her. And I stuck my hand in my pocket and I felt a penny in my pocket. I, I looked at my wife and I said, have you got a penny? And she looked and she didn't have one. And I said, well, I've got to go to the car. I've got to find a penny. And you had a penny. And you gave it to me. You had no idea what I wanted it for. But I walked up to Lily, and I just handed her two pennies. And she started laughing. 
And I, I started crying. Because I knew it would be my last time to do it. Um, but the good news is, because of Jesus, I'll get to see her again. One of my favorite preachers, who's been dead for a number of years now, was a man named Pastor Morris Venden. Didn't used to like him. Back when I was younger, I would only listen to him when I couldn't sleep because his tapes worked better than any sleeping pill that I could, had ever had. But then someone told me, try listening to him when you're awake. And when I did, it changed my life, changed my ministry. And there was one sermon that he loved to preach. And he always began that sermon with a sentence that if you didn't stop to let him explain it, it could be very offensive. But he'd start the sermon and say, I just love a good funeral. And that sounds weird because funerals are when we all get together and cry and we're sad. But I then listened to his explanation and I liked what he said. And he pointed out that there are good funerals and there are bad funerals. So I want to ask you today, what would you like this to be today? How many of you want this to be a bad funeral? Okay, how many of you want this to be a good funeral? Good. Well, what's the difference? What is the difference between a good funeral and a bad funeral? The difference is the subject of the funeral. You see, a funeral is a bad funeral when the entire focus of the funeral is on the person who died. If we wanted this to be a bad funeral, then all we would talk about today is Lily, and then you'd go home. We would come here, pay our respects, tell her goodbye, and that's it. That would be a horrible funeral. What makes a funeral good or bad is determined by the subject. So if the funeral is all about the dead person, it's a bad funeral. What, what would make it a good funeral? Then who should it be about? It should be about Jesus. The bad funeral is focused on the deceased. The good funeral is focused on the one who is going to resurrect the deceased. So we've spent time now talking about Lily. Now we're going to talk about the only one who is ever going to make it possible for us to see her again. And I make no apologies for what I'm going to say today. Turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I love the book of John. It's my favorite of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all seem to copy each other. John is the only one of the four that's unique. There's very little repetition in John of things that are in the other three. John chapter 6 is a great chapter. It has several things in it that, that we're familiar with, if you're familiar with the Bible at all. It begins 
The first 15 verses, it's the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, but really, he didn't feed 5,000. Jesus did not feed 5,000. 5,000 is only the men. We don't know how many women and children were there. Jesus probably fed 20, 30, 50,000 people that day. We don't know. And then after he feeds the 5,000 the 5, men, plus the women and children, it goes on and it tells the story of Jesus walking on the water, going away. In verses 22 to 24, we find the crowd that had seen Jesus the day before, the crowd that had eaten the loaves and the fishes the day before. They go around looking for him, trying to find him. The good news is, through Jeremiah 29, he says, if you, you will seek me and you will find me if you search for me with all your heart. And so they searched for Jesus until they found him. And then he preached to them some more. He taught them some more. And he spends the rest of the chapter expanding on the idea that he is the bread of life. And that true satisfaction only comes from him. And finishes with what even the disciples themselves said was the hardest lesson that he ever gave them to learn. I want to focus for a moment in John chapter 6 on verse 28. John chapter 6 and verse 28. This is some of the Jews who had been listening to him. They come to him. In verse 28, they say to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? What must we do? That is a question that has been asked over and over and over again throughout the centuries. What must we do? What must I do? In fact, it's repeated other places in the Bible. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. The jailer asks, what must I do to be saved? Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. The man asks Jesus, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? What must I do? What must we do? And when that question is asked, you can put three different <laughs> emphases on the question, on what your focus is. Some people ask the question, what must we do? What must we do? We got to do something. So what have we got to do? If we want to be saved, if we want to follow God, what must we do? And we have been plagued in this church with people who think that their walk with God is based on a checklist of all the do's and the don'ts and all the rules. There is no salvation in following rules. Nobody is going to be saved by following rules. Doesn't matter how good you follow the rules, you're not going to be saved by following rules. But they ask, what? must we do? And, and they think that they can show God their big long list of accomplishments and think that that's going to make it all right. That's going to get them in there. No, 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 no. God's not impressed with your list, your checklist. 
It's not going to get you there. It's not about what must we do. Other people would ask it this way. Well, what must we do? Where's the focus there? The emphasis is on we or me. People ask it that way. They think everything's about them. But the reality is it's not about us, it's about Jesus. Third way, what must we do? Again, thinking it's all about works, it's all about behavior. I've discovered over the years that too many people spend all of their time making the gospel so complicated that nobody can understand it, that nobody can follow it, when the truth is the gospel is the most simple message in the Bible. If you read the Bible from cover to cover, memorize the Bible from cover to cover, and you don't learn the gospel, you have wasted your time. You have gotten nothing out of this if you don't know the gospel. But people make it complicated. One, one, one example I can give you, there's a, there's a lady, um, Seventh-day Adventist lady, she, she decided to write a book called What Must I Do to Be Saved? And this woman does not know the gospel. And so because she does not know the gospel, she has to come up with what must I do to be saved? So, so it's all about a list of rules. And the woman spends, I kid you not, 1,424 pages giving you every imaginable rule and regulation that she thinks you have to follow if you're going to be saved. That's her explanation. What must I do to be saved? The Bible gives a different answer. The Bible's answer does not take 1,424 pages. It takes one verse. Acts chapter 16, verse 30, they brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Seems to me like we have a contradiction here. We've got one person giving you 1,424 pages of behavioral regulations that you have to follow in order to be, to be saved. But then you have the Apostle Paul telling you in one verse that if you want to be saved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Well, I'm sure the lady is a nice lady, but I choose to believe Paul. And I don't need her 1,424 pages to be saved. And the good news is neither do you. All you need is Jesus. Acts 16.31, believe in the Lord or on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So back to John 6 where they had asked him the question, what must we do? John 6, 28, they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And look at how Jesus answers them. In verse 29, Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you stop eating meat and cheese Wait, hold on. I need to clean my glasses. Oh, sorry. I, I misread it. This is the work of God that you believe in him 
whom he has sent. Amen. This is the work of God that you believe. They're saying, what must we do that we may do the works of God? Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe. Now, I don't want to just stick with surface reading here. I want us to dig into what he's saying here. He's not just saying that belief is a requirement. He's not even saying that belief is the only requirement. The truth is, without his help, we can't even make it that far. We can't even work up enough faith. We can't even work up enough belief on our own. God has to give it to us. This is the work of God that you believe. So your saving faith in Jesus is actually given to you by God. You didn't develop it yourself. Revelation 14, 12, we Adventists, we can quote this verse up and down, left and right. And it's a great verse, I love it. Here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, depending on your translation, faith of Jesus, or keep their faith in Jesus. And, and bless our hearts, a lot of us, we love to focus on that first half of the verse. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And I believe that God's people do keep the commandments of God. But too often, we get so hung up on that first half of the verse that we minimize the second half of the verse. <coughs> Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, or faith in Jesus. Two translations, and it seems at first like they say two different things, but Jesus said that this is the work of God that you believe, so if you're going to have saving faith, who has to give it to you? He does. And so, yes, you have to have faith in Jesus to be saved, but who is it that gives you the faith? He does. So your faith in Jesus has to be the faith of Jesus. So both translations are correct. If we could just get it, if we could just understand how simple the gospel really is, then we wouldn't have to fear. Too many people, and I'm going to say too many Seventh-day Adventist people, are afraid because we don't know the gospel. We have been taken over by Things like, like a, a, a satanic heresy called last generation theology that says that your salvation is based on how perfect you become. None of you are ever going to be saved by your perfection. You are saved by his perfection. Any perfection you ever get is going to be because he gives it to you. You never earned it. You didn't work towards it. Not getting the gospel right creates nothing but fear. Fear of the last days. Fear of the end. Fear of death. I was talking to Papa last night. And I asked him, can you tell me what some of Lily's favorite Bible texts were. And he said, well, I can, I can give you one. But he said it didn't become her favorite text until just the last four days. He had taken her to the hospital here at Malvern. They said it was just a kidney infection. You'll be home in, in a couple of days. You'll be fine. 
But she said, mm -mm. she said, I'm not going home. She says, I've seen my house for the last time. She says, I'm going to die in the hospital. And she said to Papa, I don't know if I'm ready. There's nothing sadder than someone not knowing if they're ready to meet Jesus. One of uh, our famous Seventh-day Adventist writers, Ellen White, she makes a statement that is very familiar to most Seventh-day Adventists, and, and we can quote it. She says that there is not even one in 20 people on the church books who are ready to meet Jesus if he comes. And for many years, I misunderstood that. See, I would read that and I would say, yeah. They're not ready because they haven't overcome everything. They're not ready because they haven't stopped doing this and they haven't stopped doing that and they haven't changed this and they haven't changed that and they haven't given this up and they haven't given that up. That is not what she is talking about at all. Because the context in when she said it is everything. She wrote that statement very early in the period of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, years before the year 1888. She, she wrote this at the time when we were at our best on behavior. She wrote this at the time when we were very, very zealous at focusing on the law, focusing on behavior. The problem is, back then, that was all we focused on. The typical Seventh-day Adventist attitude before 1888 was, you Baptists are preaching the gospel, so we don't have to. We'll let you Baptists preach the gospel. We're going to preach the law. And Ellen White said, we have become as dry as the hills of Gilboa because of that. I'm going to be even bolder than that. A Seventh-day Adventist who only knows the gospel and, or excuse me, excuse me, a Seventh-day Adventist who only knows the law and does not know the gospel is not saved. Because the law does not save. Jesus saves. So she made that statement that not one in 20 is ready in the period when we didn't know the gospel. And so Lily says to Papa, I don't know if I'm ready. How can I know? And Papa told her about another verse in John 6. That's what brought me to this chapter for today. He told her what Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 37. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And she, she said to him, does the Bible really say that? He said, yes. She said, you mean it's that easy? Mm-hmm. Well, why don't I do that right now? And she did. And how was she those last few days? He said she was at total peace. Amen. Total tranquility. Fear of death and dying was no longer there. No reason to be. She'd found the gospel. And we got to the hospital to visit her that Sunday. And I'm blessed with a very special wife. I'm a pastor, but so is she. My pastor is in churches. Hers is in the hospital with the sick and the dying. 
It's, lo- it's great to be married to a chaplain. And she had a special visit with Lily that day. And I want to invite her to come up now and tell you about it. To put some context into what I said to Lily, I have to tell you about what happened in my mother in 09, very briefly. Um, She has an allergy to a certain type of anesthetic. And when they gave it to her, it made her flatline. And she... um, they were able to do a clinical save on her, but she was dead, literally clinically dead for about 10 minutes before they revived her. And she didn't have one of those, you know, experiences like you hear about on TV. She said she remembered, she was awake again after the surgery when this happened, but the, but the allergic reaction was still occurring. And she said she remembered losing consciousness and going to sleep. It was like she went to sleep. And then the next thing she knew, it was the next morning, and she woke up in the ICU. And the doctor came in and told her that she had been clinically dead that it had been it would have been for about 10 minutes um, she did suffer some brain damage because of that because the brain can't stand being you know without oxygen for that long but you know she she said she stopped being afraid of death of that moment because she realized that it really was like going to sleep and so when Ethan and I went to say goodnight to Lily she was actually in the hospital room helping to plan this memorial. And I said to her, isn't it kind of strange, you know, being in here and and listening to people plan this? And she said, yes. And I suddenly felt moved to tell her something. And I said, I told her what I told you about my mother. And I I said, do you want to know what she said about what it's like? And she said, yes, I do because they had told her that it would be very, very soon that this would happen. And I told her, I said, my mother really just remembers losing consciousness, just like you would if you went to sleep. And she really, there, there was no pain. And the next thing she remembered was waking up in the ICU and it was like when she was a little girl and she'd fall asleep in the back of the, of the car and her father would bring her into her bed and lay her down so that she could spend the night in her bedroom. And so the next thing I said to Lily, you will know, is waking up in the morning and seeing Jesus come. And she, her hands, she was in so much pain, she had her hands hidden under the blanket. And she stuck her hand out and took my hand and squeezed it a little bit and said, thank you for telling me that. Thank you. So she was at peace. Because once she realized that Jesus would not cast her away, once she came to him, she no longer thought she wasn't ready. She now knew that she was ready. And I feel so sorry for any Seventh-day Adventist who says, we can't know. 
if we're ready? That, who says we can't know if we're right with God? Who says we can't know if our sins are forgiven? We can't know if we're saved or not. The Bible says, 1 John 5, starting with verse 11, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. That's present tense. If you have Jesus, you have life. You have eternal life right now. Amen. You might go to sleep for a while. And that's what Lily's doing now. She's sleeping. She's, she's taking a nap. A well-earned nap. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. If you don't know it, you can. Because it's not about you, it's about him. It's not about your behavior. It's about his death, his sacrifice. And he said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Does that mean once saved, always saved? Well, I'm, I'm as a Seventh-day Adventist, there's certain things that I believe and there's certain things that I don't believe. And I might not necessarily believe in once saved, always saved the same way that you do as a Baptist. But I can tell you right now that as a Seventh-day Adventist, I believe in once saved, always saved, as long as you stay saved. Amen. You get saved by coming to Jesus. You stay saved by staying with Jesus. Amen. I'm going to sing now. And you know how to work this thing. me strength to rise again when I'm weary from the struggle of it all oh I listen how I listen for his call For heaven sounding sweeter all the time Seems like lately it's always on my mind Someday I'm gonna leave this world behind Heaven 
sounding sweeter all the time. You know, it's hard to lose a loved one to the grave. Oh, but we have that blessed hope in that wonderful promise that Jesus gave. For my God will wipe the tears from our eyes when he takes us to that home beyond the sky. For heaven sounding sweeter all the time Seems like lately it's always on my mind Someday I'm gonna leave this world behind heavens sounding sweeter all the time heavens sounding sweeter all the time Amen. How many of you want to see Lily again? Well, you know what you have to do. You have to make sure you know Jesus. Don't worry about all that other stuff. That's his problem, not yours. You don't need to clean yourself up to come to Jesus. You come to him exactly as you are. It's his job to clean you up. He will take you exactly as you are. It doesn't matter what you've done or how recently you did it. He will take you right now. And he will clean you up. And he won't just forgive you. He will look at you as if you never did those things in the first place. Because when you come to him, you are already considered just as perfect as he is because of his grace. It is a gift from God. He just asks you to believe it and to accept it. So if you haven't done so, I want to ask you to do that before this day is over. Make your decision that it's no longer going to be about you, but it's going to be about Jesus. I think we wanted to um, open the floor now for anyone here who has a special memory of Lily that you wanted to uh, share. We wanted to give you that opportunity now. Um, do we have a roaming mic or anything? Where? Okay. Um, Ricky, could you... Uh, pass the mic around to whoever wants to say something. I don't have a lot of memories of Vivian because she was at Gentry a lot of the time, but a lot of us here knew her long before any of you. We were pre-Wayne era. <laughs> I don't know what season you'd call that. But Vivian was a wonderful person, just like everything they said. She was sweet, she was caring, she was thoughtful, 
and she was a lot of fun to be around. I came in one day, she was at the piano up there and I just sat down and everybody else was in class. And she says, you know, I got, I'm in charge of singing this month. How about singing a song for me? <laughs> no. Guess what I ended up doing? I had special music the next Sabbath. And she did it in such a loving way. You just couldn't say no. There was always a sweet smile on her face and a sweet gleam in her eye. Hi <laughs> to everybody. Um, it's good to see you all. Vivian is very special for me. I don't know how long we came to Malvern, but it's been a long time. This is the first church that, that uh, we stayed, actually. We just visited a couple of times at Springs. And then we came to Malvern, and Vivian was shining. <laughs> she shined for me. I'm a very strong character lady. That's what I want to think, you know. But uh, life showed me that uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe make me a little difficult to, to cling to, to friendship. Um, when I met Vivian and felt his warmth and, and her, her warmth and love and unconditional love, unconditional, whether I was there or not, not there, she loved me and I loved her. I had only, I have many sisters, many brothers through all the life in church. I'm an old Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, but friends among all sisters, I have few, very few, very few. I love all of them, and don't take me wrong. I love my sisters, I love my church, I love the people. But friends that get to your heart are few. And Vivian was a friend to me. She befriended me. She loved me. She took care of me singing. I loved to go to her piano and sit down with her and, and sing. Or just listening and following her playing, singing along. It was so beautiful for me. So many, many times. I missed her. I miss her when I stopped coming to church, to Malvern. But again, I am, I love, I love dearly. It's just myself, how I was brought up in, in life. But when I saw her again, she loved me. And I loved her. And I know that when I see her again, when I will see her again, when I'll see Vivian, oh, she will give me a big hug. And then we will sing together, because I love to sing with Vivian again. God bless you all, and the Lord be with you. And we are here only for a little time, but we want to meet again and love each other again. And then there's not going to be anything wrong with us or with our nothing. We would love us. The Lord loves us.
I just wanted to say Vivian was very, very special to me. And, uh, you know, when there were people that were ill, there were sometimes some people that I didn't want to go see. But with Vivian, I always wanted to go see her. And uh, I just wanted to say the one thing that stood out in my recollection about Vivian was that I never ever heard her say a harsh word about anybody or to anybody. And that's few people that I can think about in the whole world that, that, that I can say that about. They never talked about anybody else in a harsh way. She never, she never talked about anyone else in a harsh way or I, I never heard it anyway, but uh, I know if there's anyone that will be ready, it'll be Vivian. And uh, I hope to see her again in heaven. Amen. Well, uh, I just want to say that uh, Vivian was very special. Uh, I've known her ever since I can remember, <laughs> uh, since the 50s for sure. I had to go see her when she was up there. I was talking to her, and, uh, you know, when I, I asked her, I said, uh, I told you, you know, it, it'd be okay. I said, you know, it'd just be a minute and you'll wake up. We'll be there. And I said, uh, are you ready? And she said, yeah, I'm ready. She said, uh, if anybody asks, just tell them I'm okay. I'm okay. She'd always say that. But uh, I don't know. I I was there right before the, all the girls got there, and she said, uh, I said, well, I got to go. I, you know, I told her I loved her, and I'd see her. And she said, well, I guess we're going to have a pity party. <laughs> that ain't something. Well, I guess I have the floor on this one, so I'm going to make it short and sweet. Uh, few people have really influenced my life outside of my family, like the Matlock family. You know, they have been my friends for me. You know, they have seen me uh, go through my trials when I lost my mom and dad. And Brother Wang and his incredible wife, Sister Vivian, my best friend Daryl and his father and his wife, they're just like my family to me. And believe me, that touched my heart when I didn't know she was that sick. But I know, you know, we all have to make that journey. And I thank God that y'all is part of my life. I thank God of that. I thank him for everything. Each and every last one of y'all is just like my family to me. Y'all... That's all I can say. <laughs> I would like to share with you the most precious moment of my entire life. It happened while she was on her deathbed. I had explained to her what I understood the Bible teaches about the state of the dead. So there are two lines of thought. Now, the most popular one is that when you die, uh, your body goes back to dirt where it came from. The air goes back into the atmosphere. Your spirit returns to God who gave it. And that is believed to be the conscious mind. The other line of thought is called soul sleep. And uh, the difference, it won't make any difference which way you believe. It's going to seem instantaneous to you when you die and when you breathe that last breath then uh, the next instant you're going to realize that you're awakening be it going straight to heaven or be it in the resurrection 
The, the one thing that I'm not going to elaborate on that, although there's some very interesting things because I've done a really deep study on it, the one point I wanted to share with you was uh, when I explained that to her, I said the, the big difference when you wake up, uh, you won't be looking at that old cooch you're looking at now. And that's what I'm telling her about it. It's going to be that young guy in his new body that you married. And uh, she, uh, she accepted that, and she had peace all the way through it, as Ethan told you a while ago. But when she had seen everybody that she knew was coming to see her, she told me she was miserable. She'd so call a nurse and tell her, let's get this over with. So I called her, and then they came and removed the life support. Said all it would do to extend her misery anyway. Both her kidneys and her liver had been completely destroyed, so they couldn't even use dialysis to extend her life. So they gave her morphine and promised her she would be comfortable. So when they removed the life support, uh, that didn't mean pulling the needles. I used to think that's what it meant, but they just removed the uh, IV that was keeping her alive and uh, put the morphine in it so it would keep her comfortable while the problem finished the job for her. And she went to sleep, and about two hours deep in that, she suddenly grabbed a hold of her cover and threw it back and uh, started waving both arms wildly and rolling her head back and forth like that and her eyes with it. And uh, I'm right there by her and I knew she was looking for me. And I jumped up right quick. And uh, the last couple of weeks she hadn't been able to sleep hardly any at all. And so I'd rub her forehead and push her hair back and she'd drift off to sleep a little bit, wake up and I'd do it again. And neither one of us got very much sleep during that time. But I started doing that again, and as soon as she laid eyes on me, she stopped moving. But she had the awfulest, terriblest look on her face, a look of horror. She's still looking at the same old coot. <laughs> she thought she had awakened, you know. Bless her heart. I started rubbing her forehead to relax. It isn't over. You're still with us. When they gave you the morphine and stopped the misery, you were so tired, you just went to sleep, and you've taken a nap. It's still going to work out just like I told you. And, oh, folks, I'm telling you, watching that, watching that look of horror get out of her face and the serenity came back, I can't think of anything in my whole life that I appreciated more than that. The confidence returned, and she faced it bravely, fully confident, knowing that as soon as she did pass out for the last time, that I would be there, and I would be as close as we can imagine in the body of the young guy she married. And then besides that, Jesus had told us that uh, we couldn't even imagine what it was going to be like. And I told her, that when you think about it, we don't know what it's going to be like. We talked about this while she's still alive. Jesus had said there will be neither marriage nor given in marriage, and she wanted to know what that meant. I don't know, but I said, whatever it is, it's infinitely better than what we've had here, and you know when you think about it, I can't imagine anything better than what I've had with you. I don't know if I can stand it or not. <laughs> so we're happy with whatever it is he has in mind for us. And ironically, in the study and I've been doing in my personal study, nothing to do with any assignments or anything, I just ran across where Jesus said that. And he told the Sadducees, he's talking to them, and he said, your mistake is because you don't know what's in the Bible. You don't understand it, nor the power of God. 
And he explained a little bit about the marriage situation, but he didn't mention the power of God. But oh boy, this old fellow has quite an imagination. And I'm, I'm going to do a little writing on that. One of these days, some of you may get to see it. And you're going to be surprised what my imagination says that king up there can do. And that, uh, you know, it's just imagination. What he really can do, we can't even imagine. <laughs> I just wanted to share that with you and let you know that, that lady went to sleep in peace and she believed in her heart and all sincerity that it was in what would seem to her like a, an instant in time, we're going to be reunited. And uh, the problem is not with the person who passed away, but the one who stayed behind during the separation time has got the tough problem. Many of you have already been through that, so you know. But I'm standing up on it very well. I have her pictures all over the house. Wherever I sit down, I can see her, and I don't ever want to put them away. Uh, I'm ready just as soon as he's through with whatever he kept me for. and. I'll get to be with her again. We're at the bottom, y'all. Uh, for a closing tribute to my mom, I thought I'd ask y'all to stand. And I'll have a word of prayer, and then I want to sing the chorus to my mom's favorite song. That if you ever went to her house and listened to her play the piano, this one song she always plays. Family of God. I had to remember the name of it. So if you know the song, join me with it. Let's bow our heads. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for the life of Vivian Matlock, the the light that she was for us, the friendship that she showed all of us, and the love that she shared with all of us. We ask you now, Lord, to protect us as we leave this place and to give us safe trips back home. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tents with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Thank you all for coming. If you've got time, stick around and visit with us. If not, you're free to go. Thank you.